Hi, everybody, and welcome to this session. Um, you know that the theme of this year's convention is digital dynamism for, for adaptive food systems. Uh, one of the foundations for that is having in place strong policies, strategies, and being able to do regular assessments to see how things are going um, with, the, with the compliance and adherence to the terms of those uh, documents and, and, and those, those roadmaps. Um, to enable this um, is, is really important, and it's, it's one of the foundations of, of being able to deliver on, on adaptive food systems. So today we're focused on, on hearing about how CGIR is going about doing this, and we'll hear from a slew of speakers, both in CGIR and uh, outside CGIR, uh, to help us understand this environment. So I'm going to start by handing over to uh, Madina Bazarova, uh, who is part of the CGIR system's uh, internal audit function. Over to you, Madina. Greetings from sunny Montpellier. I'm Madina Bazarova, and I'm the head of CGIR system internal audit function. And today I will be presenting the results of the data management maturity assessment that we carried out uh, a few weeks ago. So Thomas Redmond said, once that where there is data smoke, there is business fire. So I think everyone can find some meaning in this quote for me. <laughs> what it means uh, is that um, the data, the value of data is that it reflects uh, the intensity of business activities. Um, I think it's it worth talking about uh, uh, what were the origins of this review. And it relates to the role of internal audit to protect and enhance organizations' value. So we started asking questions. Uh, as data is our strategic asset, are we protecting it? Um, are we maximizing the value derived from the data? And also, are our data management processes support the maximizing of value of data? And this is all within the context of CGRR transitioning to uh, one more integrated uh, arrangement, which creates an opportunity for better data management arrangements. So what is the objective of this uh, engagement? The objective is to help CGR to maximize the value of data by identifying opportunities to improve the way we manage it. Uh, and this review was approved in 2019 by the then System Management Board to assess the data management maturity. And so CGR internal audits partnered with Accenture, Accenture Development Program to deliver uh, this review and of course with active participation from our colleagues from the platform for big data in agriculture and uh, data management focal point across CJRR. How did we do it? So Accenture brought in their broad methodology for uh, assessing data maturity and, and you can see on the right hand side here. Um, it includes four capabilities uh, and 12 sub capabilities. This is a broad uh, methodology that is based on well-known data management uh, maturity uh, frameworks. And as a first step, we worked to adapt this methodology to uh, CGR environment and needs. And we work with, with our colleagues um, from the platform for big data uh, to uh, really calibrate the questions that would allow us to assess the maturity. So the output of this was tailored um, tool to assess data management maturity. Second step, uh, Accenture collected a lot of documents from all the entities across the JR, policies, procedures related to data management, policy, uh, management um, and analyzed them, and then conducted interviews uh, with all uh, data management uh, focal points uh, across CGR and researchers to understand the actual practices of application of data management policies. All of this information then was mapped uh, against the capability model uh, and the result, uh, a maturity heat map was produced and we can see it uh, later in the presentation. 
so what happened next? Next, we, we uh, organized a vision workshop um, with participation uh, of over 40 uh, data management uh, specialists across CJR um, and our colleagues from the platform for big data. And we talked about um, what could be the vision for data management in the future uh, in CGR, and what are the constraints to achieving that vision. As a result, Accenture suggested a number of uh, measures that we can take to improve our data management and to take it to uh, closer to the vision that we have. So let's have a look at, this is maturity model uh, that was developed and tailored to uh, CGR needs. Uh, it has five maturity levels from initial to optimized all across 12 capabilities. In each, in each definition, uh, an intersection of the uh, levels and capabilities reflects specific needs of CGR. What you see here is the heat map, uh, is the result of mapping out of all of the processes and procedures that we have in relation to data management across all of these 12 capabilities. Each role represents a CGR entity and its maturity level across the capabilities. Uh, we anonymize this, so not to embarrass uh, our colleagues. Uh, and uh, under each column, you can see where we are more or less uh, mature. Um, for example, uh, the green color reflects uh, uh, further maturity and maybe a red color, uh, a, less, a lesser maturity. So, um, and based on all this work, um, uh, Accenture uh, suggested uh, a number of recommendations and it's, it's a, it appears that a majority of weaknesses relate to um, a dispersed dispers nature of, of our data management processes um, and it calls for um, better integration and, and perhaps some unified governance to oversee the implementation of open access and data management policy that we have and has been revised uh, at the moment. Um, it also talks about the need to um, improve leadership uh, in relation to data management and resourcing. There needs to be an appro appropriate tone from the top uh, to support uh, the development of, of data management and maximizing the value from it and active participation from, uh, from the researchers in it. Um, and as well, uh, some areas for improvements include strengthening processes to um, improve quality of data and, and its security. Um, I'll stop there and I'll hand over to Kat Katrin Reynolds, who will talk about the revision and review of the open access and data management policy. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Medina. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting myself and Cabby here today. I'm Catherine Reynolds. I'm a data analyst and steward at Cabby. And I was part of this team that conducted the review of the open access and data management policy this year. So what is this, this open access and data management policy? So it was published in 2013. It mandated the publication of information products, open access and free from uh, restriction from across CGIR. Um, there's been since this time significant progress in CGIR towards this goal. There's also been a lot of change in the kind of research environment within which CGIR sits in terms of data sharing practices and, and kind of the research environment. Um, kind of quite noticeably the um, development of the FAIR data principles. So, so what are these principles? It may be a term that you've, you've heard before. For those of you who don't know, the FAIR data principles are a guiding framework for data management, which states that uh, data to be shared well needs to be findable. So people need to know where to find it. It can't be kind of squirreled away on, on hard drives. It needs to be accessible, interoperable. So people need to be able to understand it and have it exchanged between systems and reusable. So people need to know the term 
zones for which they can uh, reuse data. So these principles came from the research community in uh, 2016. They were published in a paper. They've been adopted by donors, public publishers, other research organisations. We'll kind of come, come back to who some of those are kind of later on in this talk. Um, but all of this is to say there's a lot of change going on internally, externally. There was also deadlines in, in the policy as well, which led to CABI being commissioned to conduct this review. So how did we um, approach that? So we can kind of see here, I think that was kind of under the, the banner of, of one of Medina's slides too, this idea of people, processes, technology, we're thinking about adaptive food systems, technology is very important. It tends to be where people focus on kind of the, the platforms um, that need to be built to enable data to be shared. Also process as, as this session shows um, and is discussing is, is also really important. Underpinning all of that is people. It's people using these processes, using these technologies. So we really need to make sure that they are fit for purpose. They're fit for those people to maybe change the behavior that is needed to get to where data is shared if it's not historically something they've been used to. So can we have a very people-centric approach, um, understanding these systems, what is needed for them in order to, to be able to share data effectively? Um, so we focused on the process. We did an expert assessment using a, how to write a fair and open policy checklist. And then we also conducted a series of interviews with people from across CJIR, people involved in implementing policy. What were some of their successes? What were some of their challenges? And, and what, would their, what are their needs for, for a new policy? So from these methods, we found 44 recommended changes to the policy um, implementation guidelines and also some operational changes as well to make sure that the policy is resourced, um, compliance is monitored, the, the environment in which it sits is enabled to make it able to be implemented. So what did some of these changes look like? So we have a shift from kind of open to fair, that's reflective of this um, environment, uh, this kind of changing environment. Um, within the previous policy, it, it was quite a binary approach. So your data had to be completely open um, after 12 months of, of publication of a paper. Um, actually data, some data can't be published open, some data it's not appropriate or you, you just can't publish it, maybe it contains something personal and we increasingly see that data actually exists on a kind of spectrum of openness as shown here. So some data needs to remain closed, um, some data can be completely open but actually there's a whole um, number of gradations between those where data becomes increasingly shared without becoming completely open. Um, within the new policy, there is, there is recognition of that, but also that data should always be fair. So even if you cannot publish it completely open, free from restriction, you should still be managing it well and managing it in a way that makes it fair, interoperable, easy to understand, easy to reuse for those who can, who can use it. Within the policy, there, there's a lot of rules on, on how to do that um, and how to make it fair. Um, some, some other of the new rules, so having one of the successes that we saw in the interviews was having data managers involved from the beginning increased the value of the, the outputs at the end. So having data that was easy to understand, easy to share with project partners in a place where everybody can find it was, was a real key success. So mandating them being involved from the beginning um, was something we put in the policy. So it needs to be sufficiently resourced. So within project budgets, there needs to be allocation for data management to ensure that that, that can happen um, and that projects should remain open until these data assets are logged and, and stored with data managers, that there's a robust data management plan in place. Until that happens, the project is, is going to remain open. An incentive. So you're, you're doing all of this work to manage your data uh, more effectively, to make it good for reuse, to make it good for kind of agricultural research more generally. You should be rewarded and recognised for doing that work. So that should become part of appraisal processes, incorporating the metrics of Guardian, the, the Guardian platform. 
Um, so at a centre level, you can see how fair the data assets are being produced, and also you get individual recognition for, for managing your data fairly as well. So as, as kind of previously alluded to, this, this work isn't sitting inside a vacuum. So I'm just going to briefly discuss some of the work we've been doing with the Gates Foundation and some of the donors and publishers who are increasingly talking about fair data in, in their policies. Um, so the work we've been doing with Gates, we've been involved in a three year project with them. Um, kind of understanding that despite there is a, the Gates Open Access Policy, there's a lot of data generating grants um, from the Gates Foundation, data isn't necessarily being shared in the, in the way they expect. So we've been doing a lot of ecosystem work, a lot of understanding why has this been happening, um, working with grantees on the ground, project officers to help enable the environment, ensure data sharing and, and fair. FAIR is now part of the, the Gates Open Access Policy, so this on the screen is a quote from them, saying that grantees are encouraged to adhere to the FAIR principles. It's something that's um, with the POs we're working with, kind of incorporated into kind of uh, their process. Um, and we've also been in conversation with other donors what was DFID now FCDO and how to kind of align, align these recommendations. The EU as well are using FAIR within, within their frameworks when, look, when looking at their funding. So we've, we've got donors, but we've, we've also got publishers kind of at the other end of the cycle, if you can have ends to a cycle. Um, and you can see here some of the publishers who are, who are discussing fair data sharing in, in their uh, policies. So increasingly, you're going to be asked to publish data with your papers. Increasingly, they're, they're talking about fair in their policies. So all of this is to say we, we've kind of got the donors and publishers and now the institution, those policies, uh, we've intended to make it e your life easier by aligning with these different policies. Um, kind of, uh, yeah, aligning with those policies, making the data easier to find, use and reuse according to those for the good of research and also yourself. So the person most likely to reuse your data in six months time is you. Uh, so it's great that you're uh, meeting all of these policies, but also it's going to be a benefit to, to you um, directly, um, it's going to be much easier if someone's managing it for you, you can find it, you can understand it, you're going to save yourself a, a lot of time. So all of this is designed to make kind of your workflows more efficient. So I'll kind of finish uh, on a quote here. Um, so as a scientist, you should treat your data like a love letter to your future self. So if you're managing it in a way that's compliant with all of these policies and it's and is fair, it's going to make your, your life a lot easier um, in, in the future. Um, so that's me. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm going to hand over to, to Brian now. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian King. I serve as the coordinator of the CGIR platform for big data in agriculture. And I'll speak a little bit today about uh, the connection between data and strategy of various types. Um, so the platform for big data, we've been engaged for the last several months in some strategic research and analysis, specifically looking at three key questions. Um, you know, what's happening in the, the digital landscape as relates to agricultural research for development? Uh, what should an organization be able to do to sort of navigate or leverage those trends effectively? And then what role should public interest actors or public, public good actors like CGIR uh, play in that um, evolving landscape? And so, you know, we've been engaged with um, both internal and external stakeholder groups. Um, we've you know, heard a little bit about cross-cutting uh, communities of practice and, and, and other stakeholder groups internal to CGIR. And um, we've also been engaged in semi-structured interviews with uh, mostly external actors working um, in this space. We're up to uh, latest is about 75 semi-structured interviews tending to be about an hour in length. And so, you know, that compared with the literature and these internal and external views, we started to form some ideas about uh, where should public interest actors and where specifically should CGIR being engaged. Um, you won't be surprised that data is all through that and very foundational and I'll, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in a bit. Um, but something really interesting happened in that, um, you know, that's been about the last uh, seven or eight months or so that we've been doing this research. And, you know, early on in the process is when lockdowns uh, started happening 
and um, the COVID crisis began to unfold um, around the world. And so we're actually able to put that into the strategic analysis. And so uh, some really interesting findings in terms of how COVID has shifted digital in the agriculture research for development space. And so, um, you know, you won't be surprised, you know, we all living really significant organizational shifts in just a few months where um, you know, everybody's going online and virtual. Um, leadership in organizations almost you know, universally um, have recognized the importance of digital to their very operations and existence. And um, IT, IT departments um, almost universally are recognized as having stepped up pretty heroically um, to help the organizations uh, to continue. Um, new ways of integrating digital into operations um, have, have emerged. So in the context of CGIAR, where there was um, some digitally enabled ag, ag advisory or ag extension uh, activity, those gained, increased in importance and we saw increased willingness and interest in starting to, to roll those out where those hadn't been developed yet. Um, clearly, you know, data uh, the demand for data, you know, looms large in, uh, in uh, when everybody, you know, needs to find new ways to be able to continue to do research um, and also a real increase in, um, you know, demand for computational power. Um, again, cross-cutting, almost universal that, that, that we've seen this. And, and um, uh, one of the interviewees said something really interesting once. They said, uh, somewhere in this process, they said, uh, you know, computational research has taken its place um, its rightful place, we could even say, um, alongside observational um, and experimental research. And so all of these things, you know, point to really dramatic shifts in business models and ways of doing research just over the last six months. And, um, you know, uh, the, the agriculture research for development space in the last six months has got um, vastly more digital. Um, so that's a bit of a sort of COVID, um, you know, detour about context. Um, you know, they're still looking at some of these larger trends um, as they intersect with agriculture research for development as, you know, part of this exercise. It wasn't just um, about COVID. And um, we found, you know, a few key things that we sort of distilled um, in terms of ways in which CGIAR, but we think it's true for other public, public interest or public good actors in this space, should be engaging with, um, larger trends that are affecting our sector. And so uh, the first of which is recognizing that uh, there's an increased demand and need for data. Um, there's an increasing organizational imperative to be able to capture uh, the value of your data and make it fair. Um, recognizing that there are, as uh, Catherine mentioned, very legitimate scenarios in which um, some degree of data restriction um, would be needed. And we so we need to sort of take on that complexity um, and manage it and recognize that there's always going to be some form of restriction, but it doesn't mean we stop um, observing data standards. And so, uh, you know, we need to be uh, taking on that complexity. And I think increasingly, um, you know, we can be playing a role in terms of helping to kind of intermediate, um, you know, responsible data exchange and sharing. Um, with artificial intelligence, looking at our next big trend, so you know, there's, I'm, I'm usually the first person to talk about, you know, the sort of irrational exuberance that comes uh, with, with new and exciting digital technologies, because honestly, we've seen it many times over the last, you know, few decades of, um, you know, really great potential of emerging technologies, but also a kind of breathless and, 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 and you know, un, um, uh, unrealistic expectation of what um, these technologies can deliver for us. With artificial intelligence, between the interviews and the literature review, um, I really think there's something different here. And it's really, there's a real clear signal coming through that this could in fact be different. And I think it's something about how, um, you know, the ability to kind of reason over um, or, or integrate all of the preceding information technologies um, that's, that, that, that really appears like it's, it's really powerful. And even if we end up being wrong, we're seeing that organizations are taking it very seriously and the investment um, is increasing massively. The patent applications are accelerating um, and it it's, um, has all of these kinds of signals of being a truly world-changing technology. And so um, artificial intelligence, you know, machine learning models and so forth, are extremely data hungry. And so unless you have good quality, standard compliant, fair data, 
again, we sort of are not equipping ourselves and our sector for really, um, you know, leveraging this technology effectively and I think kind of shaping how it's used responsibly um, in our sector. And those are two key areas where we really need to be engaged as public interest, public good um, actors. Um, in terms of looking outside of our organization and, you know, the, the CGIR, the whole of our organizational strategies nested within the sustainable development goals, uh, we are, you know, we, we sort of measure our own effectiveness in terms of how we contribute to those, um, to those goals, how do, uh, you know, positive changes happen in food and farming systems around the world. Um, and so digital services are a key way in which public interest actors need to be engaged. And so, um, you know, th things like, to my mind anyway, first thing that comes to mind are like uh, digital financial services being a key kind of way in which you can reach a number of small producers or a number of small business businesses in the agri-food space with, um, you know, savings or um, insurance or what have you for, you know, that directly relate to the livelihoods and resilience of folks. And so, um, again, the ability to have trusted data and analysis is a kind of fundamental precursor to then be able to have those who are, um, you know, developing products and services uh, know that they can kind of leverage off of those and um, and not have to create them all from scratch. And so I think that uh, public interest actors like CG um, can have a role in sort of de-risking and enabling and validating um, some really large scale digital services that are already unfolding in rapidly um, digitizing uh, global economy and, and society. And then lastly, um, you know, the, the ability to um, uh, generate trusted information um, and analysis that um, can help orient multiple actors around how that they can be contributing, they can also be contributing to the sustainable development goals. Um, that, that also, you know, reflects internally on us as an organization in terms of being able to provide good quality both intellectual assets, but also, you know, increasingly sort of measurements about um, uh, how CGIR is, is moving forward on realizing um, its overarching organizational strategy. Um, and of course, trusted validated data um, is foundational for that. And so I'll stop there. I'll, I would like to hand off to our uh, CGIR science officer, um, Philippe, uh, to, and um, he can tell a little bit more about this how we're engaging with um, with the wider world through our, our data and our intellectual assets. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, good morning. So my name is uh, Philippe Perul. I am working at the System Management uh, Office as a science officer and mostly in charge of the planning and reporting for the different uh, CGI research programs and, and platforms. The kind of uh, data I will be uh, describing and talking about today are the data coming from the research for development activities of all our uh, CGI research programs and, and, and platforms. And the best way to do that is uh, probably to go to the results dashboard. So I guess you can see my screen. Um, so that's uh, public access to CGR.org where you have all the information I will be uh, describing today. So first of all, the portfolio we are talking about for a portfolio of eight agri-food system CGI research programs. So you probably already know all of them uh, on, on fish, on forest trees and agroforest trees, uh, GLDC, grain legume and balance cereal, and so on. Four global integrated programs uh, on climate change, water, land, and ecosystem policies, and the supporting platforms, uh, the one on big data in agriculture, extensive breeding, gene bank, and gender platform. So all the data are collected from uh, this uh, CGR research program, and I will show you the way we are collecting this data. You can see here in presentation mode that it's a complex process because first of all, all the uh, 12 uh, CGR research programs and platforms are using different management information system to collect this data and manage this data. Uh, basically, we have two big uh, systems. So one is called Marlow. It was uh, created by uh, CCAFs in the first round of, uh, of CRPs. And uh, it's uh, now adopted by uh, several uh, CRPs and platforms. And the second system is MEL. So one of the first challenges was to make these two systems uh, available 
and, uh, and, and, uh, and talking with each other. That's what we call interoperability. That was done through a system called Clarissa. And then this uh, data coming from the different programs are quality assessed by a team of different people and moved to the SMO data warehouse where you are, we are using this data. And these data are used for a couple of key products. One is what we call the results dashboard. It was launched uh, last year and presented to our uh, council of founders. And the second one is the CGR, a system annual performance report. So what happens if you are clicking really on the results dashboard? The results dashboard, you will have all the results we are talking about, starting from big, starting from impact assessments, connected with the sustainable development goal and the high level uh, outcomes of the CGIR. So you can, all this information about the impact assessment is uh, obviously uh, accessible in the results dashboard. So this, ex this information is uh, com complying on the fair data principle. It's findable, you can see it, it's accessible. You can have access to the raw data for each of the results we are talking about. You have this uh, orange box here, access raw data. So if you click, you have immediately access to the raw data. And this database is also connected with, uh, with Dataverse. So that's really uh, important. If uh, you are uh, going to any of the clickable results from outcome impact case reports, innovations, a policy, you have immediately the list of what you want to describe. If you are on policies, you can check the policies by country, you can check the policies by type of policy, by stage of maturity, and you can go to each of these results. Each uh, policy is again accessible and uh, you can get access to the raw data for the policies, for the innovations, for all the peer-reviewed papers, for example, that's also uh, very interesting because uh, for the peer-reviewed papers, sorry, I just stopped, but I do my thing. But uh, so the, the key point here is that you have a full access to all these data for the peer-reviewed papers, sorry, that's uh, the, the page, the web page. So you have 70% are in open access, so that's accessible. Uh, you can click on these peer-reviewed papers and you have access to this information. We are working closely with the Web of Science in order to be sure that we will have this information aligned with uh, international standards. So all of that is, is there. And, uh, and finally, re regarding the, the reu reusability, I would say that all, the, all this information, all this data provided through the resource dashboard are then used to provide what we call the CGR uh, performance annual report where this information is aggregated in a different format and reused in a different format from the what we call deep dive impact stories. And, uh, and here you can again, if you click on a deep dive impact story, you have the full detail of the story with the link uh, to the different uh, uh, database and, 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 and kind of uh, uh, megadata um, feeding this, uh, this story. You can click on this uh, uh, framework, resource framework, on each of these boxes to have access to the different policies, innovations, uh, contributing to this high level impact. You can get the impact stories if you, if you are also interested in this kind of report. So all of that is available in the annual performance report. And uh, you have well understood that one of our main objectives is to try to be fully in compliance and, uh, and, and working according to the fair data principles. And that's the reason why uh, for, for, for preparing one CGR, which is the next step for the research for development activities, uh, we are uh, working hard trying to be completely aligned with the fair data principles and the policy uh, revised like it is correct. Thank you. Great. So thank you to all of our speakers. That was really excellent. Um, thanks for making the time. And of course, to all of you who attended this session. Um, I hope it was helpful. And we are very, very open to welcoming your um, comments and your questions. Please feel free to put them in the chat um, and in the or and in the discussion board uh, feature of the of the platform. Thanks again. We hope you enjoyed this session and we look forward to hearing from you.